Shalom Hebrews and Hebrews. Welcome to the channel. This is Oilfield Disciple. Today's reading of 2 Kings chapter 6 and 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If you are new to the channel, stumbled onto it by accident or been watching for a time you like the content, please go in and cl click the subscribe button with the little bell icon. Click it and get notified when I do new videos. So we can kind of get our subscriber base up here where we can actually do um, a live uh, Bible study together. You know, uh, it, YouTube requires that a YouTube channel must have a thousand um, subscribers in order to, to do live videos. And so we're quite a bit short from that. Um, but either way, we're still going to put out content and we're still going to uh, do what the Lord has called us to do, which is speak the truth. All right. Second Kings chapter six, Melakim Bait. Verse one, and the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, see the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a log from there and let us make there a place to dwell. And he answered, Go. Then one said, Please undertake to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. And he went with them, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut down trees. And it came to be as one was cutting down a tree, that the iron axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Oh, my master, for it was borrowed. So he borrowed a tool, and and now it's it's going to be a he's going to have to replace this tool which is our responsibility when we borrow some something from someone or we use something that someone else owns and our duty as as a as a good servant of our master is to return the item in as good a shape or if not better than when we borrowed it um one of my biggest deals is um, a vehicle. I very rarely have ever had to borrow a vehicle, but when I did, I don't care how much gas was in the tank whenever I received it and I drove off in it. When I parked it and give it back to the owner, he had a full tank of, of fuel in there. Um, lawn mowers, weed eaters, the same thing. Um, return it better than you received it. <clears throat> and so this dude's cutting cutting a, cutting trees and, and the axe head flies off into the water. This is coming up it's pretty cool. And so his his honor's at stake, you know, because you know maybe it's a second or third generation axe and you know, got it from great grandpa and it can't be replaced. Yes, the tool itself, but the the sediment behind behind it if that makes sense and this way cries out verse 6 and the man of Elohim said where did it fall and he showed him the place and he cut off a stick and threw it threw it in there and made the iron float and he said pick it up and he reached out his hand and took it and the king of Aram was fighting against Israel and took counsel with his servant saying, my camp is in such and such a place. All right, so Elisha hears the, the servant cry out about losing the steel ax head into the, into the Jordan River. And he makes, makes it float. That's just... I want to say it. Being a good steward of, of Yahweh's word and allowing, not showing out um, to put the Lord to the test, but to to work in the ability that God has given each of us. To some, we have more ability and some have less, but we are to work in the ability that God has given us. Elisha has already parted the waters when he came back from watching Elijah go up to heaven in a whirlwind. 
So Elijah has an extreme amount of, of miracle working powers. Um, the, the youths, when they, they were making fun of his bald head and he called the, the bear to come down and, and gobble them up, you know. Um, Elisha has, has ex miracle working powers all to the glory of Yahweh. Like remember reading yesterday where when he healed the leprous man, he didn't receive payment. He didn't want no form of payment. But yet his servant, after Elisha wasn't paying attention, wasn't watching, he ran down the road and, and he received payment um, from from the man that was healed of, lep of leprosy. Now Elisha knows about it. We'll, we'll get to that here. And I don't know if it's in this chapter or the next one, um, but there's going to be a reckoning. Um, well, actually yesterday, it did say that him and his generations would, would be leprous. We have to be careful that we don't step out of the bounds of the authority that God's given us. But we also may need to make sure that we walk in the fullness of that authority that God has given us. Like I said, some some more, some less. The more diligent you are with, with the word, the more obedient you are with following Yahweh's word, um, the more will be given you. And so now we got King Aram fighting against Israel and took up counsel, this is verse, six, verse eight, with his servant saying, my camp is in such and such a place. Now when, we, when I read where they say in such and such was said or in such and such, that's just meaning yada, yada, yada. I'm not repeating all this. Um, it's just a quick way of saying it's already been said. You know, it's like um, if you're using an illustration of a person um, down around where I'm from here, it's real common to say, well, oh, so-and-so said, you know, well, so-and-so is somebody, but for the purpose of the story, name, uh, names not need to be given. Verse 9, And the man of Elohim said to the king of Israel, saying, Be on guard, do not pass this place, for the Arameans are coming down there. And the king of Israel then sent to the place of which the man of Elohim had spoken to him and warned him, so that he was on guard there, not once and not twice. And this greatly troubled the heart of the king of Aram, and he called his servants and said to them, Declare to me, who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my master, O king, for Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, he declares to the king of Israel the words, that you spoke in your bedroom. And he said, go, see where he is, so that I send and get him. And it was reported to him saying, see, he is in the Dothan. And he sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And the servant of the man of Elohim rose early and went out and saw an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, oh, my master, what will we do? And he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Yahweh, I pray, open his eyes and let him see. And Yahweh opened the eyes of the young man and looked and saw the mountain covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed to Yahweh and said, Strike this nation with blindness, I pray. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and let me bring you to the man whom you seek. And But he led him to Samaria. And it came to be when they had come to Samaria that Elisha said, Yahweh, open the eyes of these men so that they see. And Yahweh opened their eyes. And they looked and saw they were in the midst of Shomeron, Samaria. And when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, should I strike? Should I strike? But he said, Do not strike, 
Do not strike these whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow. Set food and water before them, and let them eat and drink, and go to their master. And he made a great feast for them. And after they had ate and drank, he let them go, and they went to their master, and the bands of the army and raiders came no more to the land of Israel. Sometimes with our enemies, we ain't got to totally annihilate them. It's like, you know, I, I was talking to my wife the other day. I was like, it, it would be completely pointless for me. To, what would it prove for me to go out and beat up a drunk? You know, we were having an issue out at, the, at my motel. And so I went outside and I dealt with the issue. I didn't, I didn't have to get physical. I didn't have to get violent, loud, or anything. Whereas a couple years ago, I would have just went out and started just swinging laying hands on people for what had happened uh, but what would it have served for me to to beat up this this completely intoxicated individual sometimes um, we can do more for the glory of Yahweh by doing less than by going and ripping and tearing Verse 24. And after this it came to be that Ben Hadid, the king of Aram, mustered all his army and went up and besieged Shomeron. And there was a great scarcity of food in Shomeron, and see, they besieged it until a donkey's head went at eighty pieces of silver, and one fourth of a cab of dove droppings for five pieces of silver. And it came to be, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, saying, Help my master, O king. And he said, If Yahweh does not help you, where do I find help for you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And the king said to her, What is troubling you? And she answered, <coughs> This woman said to me, Give me your son give your son and let us eat him today, and tomorrow we eat my son. And so we cooked my son and ate him, and I said to her on the next day, Give your son and let us eat him. But she has hidden her son. We made a deal and now she ain't holding up her hand. So we got extreme famine. When the king is mocking you, saying, Where where do you want me to get food from? You know, should I should I go to the wine press or, or the threshing floor? Where would you have me go get food, woman? When the king ain't got no food, it, it times are tough. And so now we make a deal to cook and eat our children. The wickedness. See, this is Israel and their sins. The crookedness of their sins we're seeing here. Verse 30. And it came to be when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his garments. And as he passed by on the wall, the people looked and saw the sackcloth on his body underneath and said, Elohim, do so to me and more, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on him today. So now it's Elisha's fault. Now we're going to blame the prophet. And Elisha was sitting in his house, and the elders were sitting with him, and the king sent a man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, Shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of my master's feet behind him? While he was still speaking with them, then see, the messenger came down to him and said, Look, this evil is from Yahweh. Why should I wait for Yahweh any longer? Now we're going to blame Yahweh. Things aren't going right, so it's Yahweh's fault. Uh, rather than doing something constructive about the, the terrible issue you're in you know and coming up with a positive uh, solution let's just start throwing pointing fingers and, and blaming others rather than coming up with a solution a viable solution you know what what good is it going to do to take Alicia's head none other than you just shed innocent blood too often times we find ourselves in those situations. We find ourselves in situations where 
we want someone to be responsible and be held accountable for the trial and tribulation that we're enduring whether it be as a nation or whether it be as a community or even all the way down to your household somebody needs to be held responsible for this rather than taking a step back praying to the lord that he would give you wisdom and, and knowledge and utterance to seek a, a solution to come out of the problem to come out of the issue Hosea 4 6 Yahweh says my people perish for a lack of knowledge his people his chosen people his servants his friends those who are inheritors of the kingdom are perishing because they they lack the diligence to seek God with all their heart, mind, and soul. We're seeing it today. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This is pretty short. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And working together, we also call upon you not to receive the grace of Elohim in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in a day of deliverance, I have helped you. See, now is a well-accepted time. See, now is a day of deliverance. And you can read that passage in Isaiah 49, verse 8. Verse 3, giving no cause of stumbling and whatever, and whatever, so that the service is not blamed. Rather, we commend ourselves as servants of Elohim in every way, in much endurance, pressures, hardships, and distress. It's amazing. We just got through seeing that in Israel. Not making a stumbling block, not being a stumbling block, not allowing someone else to be a stumbling block, whatever the case may be, but commend ourselves as servants of Elohim. Commend ourselves as, as the ambassadors of Yahweh in every way with endurance it's going to take some it's going to take some toughing it out some grit some integrity and some of these hardships some of these pressures some of these um, tribulations <clears throat> verse 5 in stripes imprisonments and disturbances and toils and watchings and fastings and cleanness and knowledge and patience and kindness in the Holy Spirit in love unfeigned all these things or seven in the word in the word of truth and the power of Elohim through the weapon of righteousness on the right and on the left through esteem and disrespect through evil report and good report regarded as deceivers and yet true so no matter what side of the aisle, no matter where the issue may lie, no matter what, we're going to hold fast to the knowledge of truth that we're going to seek Yahweh's counsel no matter what. That's what Paul's telling them here. Verse 9. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and see, we live as disciplined and yet not killed, as sad yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many. And having none, and yet possessing all. I like it when, when a chapter of the Old Testament that I read in the day, and the chapter of the New, really coincide with one another like this is doing. What was asked of, of the king of Israel? Help me out, I'm hungry. The king's like, what do you want me to do? Well, Paul's telling us right here, no matter what. If you seek Yahweh's counsel and seek truth, there'll be a solution, regardless. Verse 11, our, ma our mouth has spoken openly, openly to you, O Corinth. Our heart is wide open. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained by your own affections. It's not our word that, that is tripping you up. It's not the truth that's tripping you up. It is your own lusts and desires that is tripping you up in the times of hardship. Verse 13. But for the same reward I speak as to children. Open wide your hearts too. 
Do not become unevenly yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? And what agreement has Messiah with Belial? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? And what union has the dwelling place of Elohim with idols? For you are, for you are a dwelling place of the living Elohim. As Elohim has said, I shall dwell in them and walk amongst them, and I shall be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Warika 26.12, Leviticus 26.12. <clears throat> Verse 17, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahweh, and do not touch what is unclean, and I shall receive you. Isaiah 52.11. And I shall be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says Yahweh the Almighty. Hosea 1.10 and Isaiah 43.6. This is the solution. What's the solution? First of all, watch the company you keep. Don't keep company with unbelievers. Those um, people who are, are wild at heart, heathens. Um, it's one thing to minister to them, but to to walk with them and, and, and have a, a daily relationship, they're going to drag you down rather than you pull them up. Right? That's the first thing we're being told here. Second of all, be holy. Come out. Be different. Be set apart. Be unique in the name of Yahweh. Guard his commands. Don't touch what is unclean, and Yahweh will receive you. And the inheritance, the grace, we're saved by grace through faith. Right? That's that's a big circle there. You're saved by grace. God automatically gives it to you. The, that's the grace. That's the empowerment to lead you to the cross, to lead you to Messiah. Faith, faith comes by hearing the word of Yahweh. Jesus says, that man not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yahweh. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that we can't please God except for faith. Our faith is what pleases God. Isaiah 55.11 tells us that Yahweh will put forth his word and it'll not return to him void. It will accomplish what he sends his word to do. What he sends his word to do. To redeem us back unto him, himself. We are his children. He is our father. Wherefore thou we cry out. Abba father. It's a nice neat little circle. Too much given. Much to do. Faith without works is dead. is we don't work for salvation we work because we have salvation i hope that blessed you encouraged you even frustrated you go look up everything i said don't just take my word for it or any other pastor's word for it or teacher or, or whoever don't take their word for it go look the black and white letters up for yourself y'all be blessed be encouraged and always be frustrated. This is Oilfield Disciple. And I will catch you guys on the next reading.